For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. There is only one name given that means and equals salvation. It is the name of Jesus, and if you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior this morning, you are saved by the only name that can do that. So praise the Lord for that. Let's revel in that as we move forward in our service this morning. Let's stand together as we sing. Father, Lord, we thank you that we can stand before you in this corporate setting. Lord, I thank you that I have the privilege of invoking your presence. It's a fearful thing, Father, to stand here in unrighteousness apart from Christ and to ask the God of this universe to come and meet with his people But I'm thankful that because of Christ, I can stand in that righteousness and beg you to be with us in this service and ask for your presence to be on each and every one of us and in the elements and in the music and in the word that will be shared later. We are a grateful people and we're thankful, Father, that we can call on your name. Please... um, Take our imperfect efforts that we have planned for you this week in this service and make them perfect and acceptable to you because of Jesus. Bless our time, Lord. We thank you for it, and we pray and we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
Let's turn t- this morning to 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3. We're coming to a close uh, these last couple of weeks in our exposition of 2 Peter. One thing that I have, that, that has really impressed itself upon me in the last couple of years as we've now gone through 2 Corinthians and now uh, coming to the close of 2 Peter is the fact that one of the primary things that we do and responsibilities that we have as a church and as a people is to protect the truth. The truth, we have, we do not fear the attack against truth from outside the church. The danger is inside the church. Perhaps when you read first or second Peter for the first time or, or, or many times in your life up until perhaps we went through this together, you looked at Peter saying, no, now understand that in the last day scoffers will come. And you thought, yeah, there'd, there'd be scoffers all over the place. Uh, you know, uh, but Peter's talking about scoffers inside the church. The defense of the gospel needs to happen inside the church. And the only way to do that is to affirm the sound doctrine and teaching that we are given in the Word of God, pay attention to it, correct our lives to it constantly. The threat for, of God's people have, 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 has never been outside. It's always been inside. Go back to the earliest times. The, the infiltration of the wicked one into God's people is his primary plan to defeat the ongoing work of the gospel. And that is what has been impressed upon me in the last few years, that, that our responsibility to defend the truth needs to happen here among ourselves. And as we adhere to this teaching, we will have success in doing that. In this final chapter, Peter is concerned that we have the wherewithal to refute the apostate false teachers that had arisen in the churches. So this whole chapter, chapter 3, centers on two refutations. The first refutation we looked at in verses 1 through 10 was a reasoned refutation. Peter used the reason of Scripture in verses 1 and 2 and the reason of history in verses 3 through 7 and the reason of theology in verses 8 through 10 to make this reasoned refutation of their heretical errors. Well, now we want to look at a second refutation in verses 11 through 18. But this morning, we're only going to deal with verses 11 through 15a. So let's read that together this morning. If you'll follow along as I read in verse 11. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn. But according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, since you are waiting for these, be diligent to be found by him without spot or blemish and at peace. And count the patience of our Lord as salvation. Peter now expects us to refute apostasy in a practical way by the very way we live. The way we live our lives is of extreme importance. Not only does it practically adorn the gospel, but the way we live our lives is evidence of the genuine salvation that we have. To the end, to the end, that if our lives do not match our profession of faith, we lack genuine salvation. There's an old truth that says... Belief or behavior follows belief. 
All things being equal, we behave according to our beliefs. If you believe that you will, you will hurt yourself if you jump off a 20-story building, you probably will not jump off a 20-story building. But if somehow you actually believe that jumping off a 20-story building will not hurt you, as a matter of fact, it might be fun to do that, then you might actually jump off a 20-story building because you will be following, your behavior will follow your belief, however misguided that belief might be. What we believe about the second coming of Christ is meant to affect the way we behave ourselves. The apostates believed that Jesus wasn't coming back. They believed that there was not going to be any judgment, and so their behavior followed their corrupt belief that Jesus wasn't coming back. And according to chapter 2, they lived in all kinds of sensuousnesses and they lived in all kinds of depravity because they believed that there was, going, there was not going to be any accounting. There's not going to be any judgment because Jesus is not coming back. Well, far too many professing Christians believe they can live in any manner they choose and still claim to have eternal life and, and many times they live lives more like these apostates than regenerate people. Is it any wonder that Peter wrote in chapter 1 and verse 10, Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to make your calling and election sure. You better be sure of this. Eternity rests on making your calling and election sure. How do you make your calling and election sure? Well, in chapter 1, if you'll recall, Peter said, listen, this is what you need to do. Make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue and virtue with knowledge and knowledge with self-control and self-control with steadfastness and steadfastness with godliness and godliness with brotherly affection and brotherly affection with love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing... They keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he is blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. And that's when he says in verse 10, Therefore, be diligent to make your calling and election sure. How do you make it? How, how are you diligent to make sure your calling and election is sure? by all of these virtues that he lists in verses 5 through 9. And he says in verse 11, for in this way, in this way, in making your calling and election sure, in this way, you will have an entrance into the eternal kingdom. Folks, this is, this is important stuff. The way we live as Christians is important stuff. And so, Note with me two practical issues now. That two practical issues of our living that is going to refute apostasy. The first is the proper profile of a believer. That's what we're going to look at this morning in verses 11 through 15a. And then next week, Lord willing, we're going to look at the proper practice of of a believer. Today we want to look at this first practical issue, the proper profile of a believer. Before, before we can live practically in a correct way, we need to know what that correct way is. So Peter lays out a profile, an outline, if you will, a, a shape of how a, pro, a proper Christian life looks. And so he suggests in this passage no less than three descriptions of that profile. What does this profile look like? Three descriptions. Number one, one who lives in purity. Verse 11 and verse 14a. Christian, Christians living lives of purity is more and more a novelty today in our culture. But this is a throwback to early centuries of Christianity after the apostles departed. When did this, when did this happen? When did this start to occur uh, among God's professed people? Well, actually it's always been because 
we've always had apostates among God's people. But the fact of the matter is, in the history of the church, after the apostles left, Christianity had, had a good run, okay, uh, where the, the apostolic uh, 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 or the post-apostolic fathers, the church, what we call the church fathers, came on the scene. A lot of great doctrine was developed and, and, and what have you. But when Christianity married itself to the Roman Empire in 315 A.D., and became the Roman Catholic Church, the terrible corruption of Christianity began in earnest. Part of the corruption that developed out of that was this divorcing of justification and sanctification. That is, it began to be held that the way we lived as Christians really didn't matter a whole lot. We could be justified we could be saved okay but not be sanctified and so justification and sanctification was divorced and so the church began to be largely overtaken by unregenerate men that could give the mass one moment and engage in debauchery the next well, the Reformation reintroduced this biblical doctrine of justification by faith alone, which then unfolded into a life of sanctification. So that in the Reformation, this, this ancient apostolic doctrine of justification and sanctification were no longer divorced, but they were reunited and wedded to one another. And the Puritan movement was largely influ uh, influential in this reuniting. This was a revival of the biblical norm and teaching of the apostles. So Peter begins this section. He reaches back into verse 10 where he speaks of the heavens and the heavenly bodies and the earth undergoing a passing away and a being burned up and exposed and so on. This being true, Peter says, if this is the case, and it is, what kind of people ought you to be? We should be people of purity. People who understand what it is to live a sanctified life. Peter introduces two sets of words to describe this purity. In verse 11, he uses the words holiness and godliness. Right from the beginning, we need to realize that Peter's eschatology, what's eschatology? Peter's teaching of last things, the culmination of all things. This eschatology is not a call for Christians to check out of the world and let it go to hell. The destruction of the world is not meant to simply be something that satisfies the curiosity of Christians. As Christians, we are not to retreat into our little Christian cells and wait for the end. As per all biblical writers, the coming judgment is not simply a gotcha doctrine against the lost. It is a motivation toward holy and godly living in this world. Why? To affect the ends that are coming and change the outcome for many who are currently trending toward that judgment. And our lives matter to that end. And whether or not we live godly and holy lives matters to that end. Now, both of these words in verse 11 are in the plural. Holinesses and godlinesses. Now, it's very awkward in the Greek. It's almost impossible in the English. Yet, it signifies the multiple ways in which we are to be godly and holy. Godliness and holiness are to be interjected into every pursuit of life, not just our religious observances. This being a Christian is a 24-7 thing, not just, a, not just at particular junctions of life, like on Sunday or a, a Sunday school or church social. Holiness, see, is our set-apartness. We are reserved unto God in holiness. I've got to adjust myself here. 
Raise your hand if you're sure. All right. Holiness is our set-apartness. We are reserved unto God. We are set apart unto God and from the world. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 15 and 16 says, Be holy, for I am holy. The world has no claim on us, and we are not to be a committed partner of this world and its system. We live and move and have our being amongst it, but we are not, we are not an integral part of it. We are not partners with it. We stand apart from it in our holiness and godliness in the gospel. Godliness, then, is our character. Imitating the character of God, we should all think of it as God-likeness. You know, the apple, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree, right? It is not hard to pick out a sly child in this church. The apple does not fall far from the tree. They all look alike. Or a manly child, right? They all look alike. They make the same thing over and over again, all right? God bless them. We love them. But the apple doesn't fall far from the tree when we're talking about our human parents, but it, it doesn't fall far from the tree when we're talking about our heavenly parent either. We should have godly traits. We should have godly characteristics. And while we will never be perfect until the glorification, it ought to be the definition of our lives that we are pursuing godliness and holiness. There are certain things true should be about us that are true about God. Certain characteristics well, we, we will never completely fulfill in this world are yet a reflection of the character and godliness of our Heavenly Father. Peter calls us to that in the context of this coming judgment. Godliness is a big word for Peter. He used it three times in chapter 1, telling us that God has given us everything we need for life and godliness. We've got everything we need to, to, to be godly. And that godliness is a key virtue that will provide an entrance into the eternal kingdom for us. Well, the second set of words Peter employs is without spot or blemish in verse 14. Again, Peter connects this admonition in verse 14 to the fiery consummation of the world in verse 12 and the new heaven and new earth in verse 13. So once again, he appeals for the practical end of this teaching on the consummation. What's the practical end of this teaching? It is ethical Christian living. Peter employs the word diligence here again in verse 14. He had used that word a couple times in chapter 1, uh, especially when he told them to be diligent to make their calling and election sure. And so this diligence here in verse 14 is to be exercised to live spotless and blameless lives. Now this is in contrast to the apostates in chapter 2, verse 13, who were blots and blemishes in the church. I don't know anybody that likes a pimple. Does anybody like a pimple? I mean, it was bad enough when you were a teenager and you had pimples. Now, sometimes when you're an adult, you still get pimples. And we try to hide those pimples. We don't like those blemishes, right? Well, who wants to be a pimple on the face of the church? Nobody, right? And yet, when we do not live spotless and, 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 and blemish, uh, blemishless lives, we become that pimple on the faith, face of the church. Now, when comparing similar language to this in the New Testament, this spotless and, and blameless you know, type, type of uh, dynamic, you look at passages in Ephesians, I think I have them listed there for you. Uh, these passages all use this terminology and they use it in terms of our salvation. They connect it with our salvation, these passages. This should cause us to understand that when we compare this language, it is necessary that we be spotless and blameless 
so that we can assure that we have eternal life. In other words, this spotless and blameless dynamic is not an option. It's not an option. It's not a, well, maybe I will, maybe I won't type of thing. Now, this should not be confused with moral perfection in this life, but the New Testament does connect godly living to salvation and that we will ultimately be perfected in the last day. The very reason the false teachers will not be saved on the last day is because of their blemished lives that will condemn them. Schreiner notes it this way. The term in verse 14, be found, is judicial, anticipating the judgment before God. There are several references there for you. Hence, there is little doubt, listen to this, there is little doubt that believers need to be spotless and blameless to be saved. Now hold on to that for a second, because he continues. Evangelicals are keen to emphasize at this point the imputed righteousness of Christ as the basis for our righteousness. And of course, Christ is the basis for our righteousness. This is not what Peter emphasized here. In this context, spotless and blameless behavior of believers is required to inherit the eternal reward. It is in this way that we will be found at peace at the end of verse 14 and be found in peace. This peace is not the peace of God, you know, that passes all understanding. This is peace with God. This is judicial peace where we are no longer considered the enemies of God. This peace is not a reality without holiness and godliness and spotless and blameless lives. We are too eager as evangelicals to flee to the imputed righteousness of Christ as our argument for not living spotless and blameless lives. And we mollify ourselves concerning the oft careless and degraded kind of living we habitually do. And we make excuses for our loved ones who one day made a profession of faith and said, I believe in Jesus. And they went to church. Maybe they even got baptized and became a member. But then they fell away and they went back to a lifestyle of debauchery and, and sinfulness and they have no mind for Christ they have no mind for the church they have no mind for the things of God and we, we say oh well they, they believed one time and they have even though they're not holy li living they, they still have the imputed righteousness of Christ there's a Hebrew term for that ba lo -mi. That is not the message of the Bible. That is not the message of the New Testament. There is no message in the New Testament that says, you can go ahead, just say you believe in Christ, you'll get his imputed righteousness, then you can live any way you want, and you'll still be okay. Not so. Not true. Peter and the other New Testament writers connect holy and godly living with salvation. No holy, godly pursuit of life, no salvation. You are in a category other than the redeemed. This notion of purity is often laughed at in the lives of many evangelicals. The term Puritan and Puritanical is like a derogatory term in many circles in evangelical. It's like, it's like an evangelical put-down. Oh, that guy, he's a, he's a pure, he's a pure, he's puritanical, you know, that kind of thing. Well, if that's the best insult that you can lay on me, lay it on me, man. Lay it on me. If, if your worst put-down to me is that guy's just too holy, that guy's too pure, then, then I will take that insult all day long, and I hope it's true. Well, there's a second description here. Not only are we to have a profile of purity in the context of this second coming doctrine, we are to be ones who live in anticipation, verses 12 and 13. The lives of believers are lives of anticipation. 
Living in anticipation is living in the now with a view toward a greater end. Remember when you were young and in love and you just couldn't wait till the next time you could be with your sweetheart, right? Now, today, it's a little different. Today, she didn't hardly get her leg in the door when you're taking off in the car. You know, it's, it's, it's one of these things. But then it was like, I can't wait. I, I can't wait till the next time I see my sweetheart. And you go about your day, you do your thing, you're at work and you may school or whatever it is, and you're fulfilling your responsibilities. But in the back of your mind, there's always, oh boy, you know, I get to see my sweetheart. And you're looking for, you're waiting for that next appointment. And so there are two elements of anticipation that Peter points out here. One is an attitude of anticipation, waiting for, used three times in verses 12, 13, and 14. He says we are waiting for, this term is translated in some translations, looking for. Our house is so situated over in the subdivision next to us that uh, out our back windows, we can see all the way down to 8 Mile. And so we know, you know, we know if, uh, if traffic is backed up uh, on 8 Mile, it'll be backed up right in front of our road. We can see down there. Well, it also affords us the opportunity to be able to watch for people that we are anticipating. You know, like, we're going to have guests over, or, or one of the kids is coming home from college, or somebody's coming for a bit, or something like that, and we'll find ourselves in our front room there, or in the kitchen, and we'll look out the window, and every now and then we'll, we'll look down there to see if they're, if they're coming, because we're anticipating, we're looking for. That's the kind of attitude we need to have in terms of the second coming of Christ. We need to be a, a people of anticipation. <coughs> And so, this is the attitude Peter says we should maintain. But what is it for which we should be waiting? Peter says in verse 12, the coming day of God in which the judgment of the earth and those upon it will come. Now, the day of God is the same as the day of the Lord in verse 10. There's virtually no difference. One simply emphasizes God the Son, while the other emphasizes God the Father. But here we are, looking forward to. What are we looking forward to? We're looking forward to the heavens being set on fire and dissolved. We're looking forward to the heavenly bodies melting away as they burn. This, this burning is described in Isaiah 63, verses 19 through 64, in which it portrays the mountains melting when the Lord manifests. The mountains melting. In Isaiah 34, 4, it talks about all the powers of the heavens will melt. Well, this, this kind of seems harsh, doesn't it? I mean, it's, it's almost like, are we supposed to be on the sidelines with a self-satisfied demeanor cheering God on to destroy everything? Well, no, wait a minute. That's not the whole story, okay? The day of God is a day of judgment and purging and cleansing, but it is a day of salvation as well because not only are we waiting for the dissolution, we are waiting for the new heaven and the new earth. God is going to create a new heaven and a new earth upon which his people will dwell. We are not simply waiting for the destruction of the old, but the creation of the new. This new heaven, new earth terminology goes all the way back to Isaiah 65, 17, Isaiah 66, 22, all the way forward to Revelation chapter 21 and verse 1. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. Why do we so look forward to the new heaven and the new earth? Now, certainly there could be a litany of reasons that we could give to answer that question, but let me suggest two. One is this. Our hearts are tethered to this creation. We are beings that were created, and God gave us a home, and that home is earth. And I don't know about you, but for many years... 
I was kind of, I kind of felt guilty sometimes because I would say things sometimes even in prayer when I was praying with God. And I'd say, God, boy, I'm sure going to miss this place. I, you know, I love the fall. I wonder how many more falls I have. And, I'm, I'm gonna, and then I catch myself and I say, wait a minute, Terry, come on, you're going to heaven, right? But, but when your view of heaven is kind of like wispy, amorphous, floating on clouds, something that we, that we don't even know, or even if it's not all the floating on clouds stuff, it's, a, it's, a, it's something that we, we just don't have, we can't get our arms around, we can't get our minds around. What is heaven going to be like? Heaven's going to be much like earth because there's going to be a new earth. And we're going to live on it. Are there going to be different dynamics? Is it going to, you know, is, are we all going to live in Livonia, Plymouth? And I, I, you know, I don't think so. But, but earth is going to be as God created it to be, the home for his children, a home for his people to live. And our hearts are tethered to this place. We are creatures of earth. I don't feel guilty anymore that I like living here that I like the existence. But it's going to be so much better in the glorification, in the eschaton, it's going to be so much better because there's not going to be any sin. This earth is not going to be cursed anymore. I'm not going to be cursed anymore. It's going to be the perfect kind of environment that God has intended that his children live in, and we will live in that environment for all eternity. But the supreme reason we look forward to the new heaven and the new earth is this. God will dwell there with us. Revelation 21, that passage that I just cited, it goes on in verse 3 to say, And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man, and he will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. This is that for which every genuine Christian heart longs, living with Jesus for eternity. So our attitude of anticipation is not that we are just eagerly awaiting the judgment uh, of the lost and the destruction of the universe. Along with that, we know that a new heaven and a new earth is coming. We need to be people of anticipation. But then we also need actions of acceleration actions of acceleration that's the second element to being a people of anticipation actions of acceleration notice what he says in verse 12 hastening hastening we are to, we are not to wait for or look for the day of god passively we have a role to play in all of this we are to hasten the coming now what in the world does peter mean when he says hastening the day of the Lord coming. How, how can we, mere mortals, hasten the day that's coming? Or, or how could we delay it? Well, first, it does no good to give the meaning here as be diligent or prepare for the day, as some translations try to do. It's just not the meaning of the, of the term. It literally means speed its coming. Peter was teaching that believers can advance or hasten the arrival of God's day by living godly lives. Douglas Moo says this, the idea that believers may actually hasten the end of history while at first sight strange is in fact deeply rooted in Jewish and Christian teaching. The rabbis taught that Messiah would come if only the entire nation of Israel would repent and obey the law perfectly for one day. Peter reflected this idea when he said in Acts chapter 3 and verse 19 when he was preaching at the beautiful gate that day, Repent therefore and turn again that your sins may be blotted out and that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send the Christ appointed for you, Jesus, whom heaven must receive until the time of restoring of all things about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets long ago. If we can have an effect on the time of the coming by the way that we live, 
How is God sovereign? Here we have another example of the biblical interplay between human actions and divine sovereignty. Evangelism is another such example. If nobody witnesses and nobody shares the gospel, people do not get saved. Why? Because God has sovereignly determined that the way people will be saved is through the proclamation of the gospel. Prayer is the same way. There are those that feel if one believes fully in the sovereignty of God, then prayer is unnecessary. God's, not, God's going to do what God's going to do. Why in the world would we pray? Not so. Because not only does God ordain the ends, he ordains the means to the ends, and part of his ordained means is that people witness and people pray. Well, Jesus taught us in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 10 to pray this way, thy kingdom come. The idea here is that our prayers will in some way affect when the kingdom arrives. Now, do not fear that Peter does damage to God's sovereignty here. God foreknows what all people will do at all times. He even foreordains what we will do. Several verses for your reference there. However, verses that teach God ordains everything must never negate verses that teach the necessity of human actions in carrying out his will. At this point, it is possible for us to be so logical that we fail to be theological. Our rational minds do not allow for two seemingly opposing ideas to be held together at the same time. Yet this is the constant tension of Scripture. If you hold exclusively to the sovereignty of God, you can negate human responsibility. If you hold exclusively to human responsibility, you can negate God's sovereignty. So here what Peter is saying is that through our holy and godly lives, through our prayers, through our preaching, through our evangelism, we can hasten... The day's coming. We must never squeeze out divine sovereignty or ignore human responsibility. Well, here's a third description of a proper profile that practically refutes apostates. It is one who lives evangelistically. Verse 15 tells us, and count the patience of our Lord as salvation. Peter now hearkens back to verse 9 where he talked about God's patience waiting for people to come to repentance. And even as we wait for all these things to transpire, we should count it as an opportunity to be messengers of salvation to a lost and dying world. We do not have a proper profile as Christians if we are not evangelistic. We do not have a proper profile as a church if we are not evangelistic. And if we are not evangelistic, we are not doing what God calls us to do to hasten the coming of the day of Christ and the day of God. Being evangelistic is part of the profile that refutes apostasy. Every time we evangelize and someone is saved and regenerate, that life refutes the heresies of apostasy. All the ideas that say salvation can be from some other way or, or, or doctrine doesn't matter or whatever, that evangelism affirms the gospel truth and defeats and refutes apostasy. We need to be an evangelistic people. Well, let me share with you a couple of insights to close this morning. Hastening language gives great significance to our daily lives. Sometimes we may feel like, you know, things really don't matter. Day follows day, month follows month, year follows year, the mundane humdrum of life seems so pedestrian, so repetitive, so banal. How much of it really matters? Well, if Peter is to be believed, the way we live has great significance in either hastening or elongating the coming of the Lord. 
Do you ever feel like your prayers are useless? Boy, I just don't, there's no power in my prayer. I just, uh, I feel like this is useless. Nothing changes, nothing really happens. I just pray because I'm supposed to pray, and it really doesn't have much meaning. Yes, they do. They are a part of godliness. They are a part of holiness. Ever feel like, you know, my honesty, my integrity, my standing for the right thing is effectively useless? Who notices? What difference does it make? Peter would say, much. Much difference. Ever feel like those private struggles with temptation make no difference whether you give in or not? It does make a difference. Everything in our life matters. We are either hastening the coming of the Lord or we are not. Now, might it be, I just throw this out here for your consideration. Might it be that the reason it has been 2,000 years is because during this church age, more godliness than godliness has been the case. Has it, has it been delayed? Has it been elongated because spotlessness has given away to carnality and spirituality has given way to sensuality in the church? We ought to get up every day. And you say, Terry, do you? No, I don't. Uh, but I need to. I need to put, I need to put on my mirror uh, uh, in the bathroom. The first person I look at every day is in that mirror. And I need to put something up there that says, will you hasten the coming of the Lord today? How will you live today that will hasten the coming of the Lord? And that leads to my second point, which is this. There is a holy and godly way to do everything. Do you know that there's a holy and godly way to argue? There's a holy way to debate an issue. There there is a godly way to drive a car. Oh my. (laughs) Now you've stopped preaching and gone to meddling, Terry. There is a godly way to paint your house. And I'm not talking about the color. There's a godly way to work in your yard. There's a godly way. There's a godly way to express your sexuality. Folks, do you ever pray about your physical relationship with your spouse? Do you ever pray about about sex? You should. There's a godly way to have a physical relationship with your spouse. There's a godly way to play basketball. There's a godly way to play softball. Everything we do can be done in a holy and godly, spotless and blameless way. And when we do that, we are hastening the coming of the day of God. Thirdly, salvation. Now before you jump out of your seats, hang on. Salvation rests upon the way you live. Now listen, that is far different than saying the way you live is what saves you. Salvation is by grace through faith and not of works. It is by grace alone, but genuine salvation is never alone. It always bears with it a life pursuit of godliness and holiness and spotlessness and blamelessness. If these things are not the result of your salvation, then you will have no entrance into the eternal kingdom. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 11. <coughs> Finally, we should be investing in permanent structures, not those that are passing away. Part of the message here is that this world is passing away. It is temporary. Why would we invest in a bankrupt business entity? This this earth is bankrupt. This world system is bankrupt. Peter Davids writes this. Peter's addressees are to be living the life of the future age, no matter how dysfunctional it may seem in this age. For the structures of this age are temporary. We will likely be surprised at how quickly they collapse. And the structures of the coming age are permanent. 
Given the massive investment of contemporary Christians in nationalism and materialism and pleasure orientation of Western culture, this passage should serve as a wake-up call. When the day comes, one's retirement fund will not be important, but rather what one has invested in the kingdom of our sovereign Lord. With that, please stand for this benediction, if you will. Isaiah 65, 17 and 18 says this, For behold, I create new heavens, and a new earth, and the former things shall not be remembered or come into mind. But be glad and rejoice forever in that which I create, for behold, I create Jerusalem to be a joy, and her people to be a gladness. May God cast our vision on him as we wait for and hasten the coming of the day of God. Go with this vision in your heart. Amen. We are dismissed. Amen.